welcome back to the Jerusalem Report. I'm Ilana Rachel Daniel. For today, there's only one thing we should be focused on, and that is the proposal for a pandemic treaty that sits on the plate of the WHO, one they seek to dish out to 194 member states, those who represent 99% of the world population. This treaty, stated plainly, allows the Director General of the WHO to dictate to your sovereign nation precisely how they must respond to the inevitable pandemic they constantly threaten us with. As the latest nauseating rumors of the newest viruses make the rounds, it's a truly sickening display of psychological warfare, with yet no forecast of easing in sight. This, in fact, is the final swooping in to take the whole of the old reigning order our best ambitions at democracy, which they've worked around the clock to destroy these past two years, the least. On November 29, 2021, the WHO's Health Assembly convened in a special session, only the second ever since its inception in 1948. Over the course of that four-day meeting, the WHO agreed to, quote, launch the process to develop a historic global accord on pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the WHO Director General, said the decision was historic, vital, and represented a once-in-a-generation opportunity to, quote, strengthen the global health architecture to protect and promote the well-being of all people. He further said, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown a light on the many flaws in the global system to protect people from pandemics. The most vulnerable people going without vaccines, health workers without needed equipment to perform their life-saving work, and me-first approaches that stimmy the global solidarity needed to deal with that global threat, unquote. And on March 3, 2022, the European Council of the EU gave the green light to start negotiations on an international pandemic treaty. Critical Sway, an investigator, formerly for the government, now for the people, did an overview of that treaty. Doing just a quick search, he found the words vaccine or vaccination appear 33 times, surveillance 30 times, misinformation 7, and privacy 5 times. Of the 131 proposals, the following are some choice pieces of what this constitution entails as it seeks to consolidate WHO power at the directing and coordinating authority on international health. Responsibility is assigned in three parts, to member states, the WHO, or to other stakeholders. It includes, you'll be shocked, more funding for the WHO, regular simulation exercises, and help by those stakeholders to combat disinformation and use their considerable data to assist the WHO. It includes more research to inform and expand public health and social measures during pandemics and increase support for the WHO research and development blueprint. The WHO obviously will act as the directing coordinating authority on international health, where it promises to depoliticize recruitment and focus on merit and competency. Member states will give the WHO more money. More investments will be made to support the development of vaccines and therapeutics. Temporary initiatives that were developed as a response to COVID-19 can now be made permanent as well as the expansion of their focus. It will see the implementation of a One Health approach to reduce risks of zoonotic diseases, that is the transmission of disease from animal to human. More genomic testing, the development of plans for emergency surveillance and response. Development of national focal points with an authority in each country and a WHO guide of best practices and regular training for those focal points. Travel and trade regulations, the increased sharing of public health data with info and info within the WHO, proactive measures against misinformation and social media attacks, stronger information management, development of a digital certificate of vaccination and of a digital contact tracing in an international context. And of course, increased vaccine development, manufacturing capacity and regulation, and initiatives to ensure those with limited means receive them. That's just to name a few. So from where does the WHO get the critical funding needed to enact such ambitious schemes? So they do from two main sources. One is member states pay a percentage of their nation's gross domestic product as decided by the UN. And that covers less than 20% of the WHO budget. The rest, that is the remaining 80%, is covered by voluntary contributions from member states and other partners. The WHO's budget's around 7.5 billion U.S. dollars. 
About 10% of those funds comes from, and I hope you're sitting down, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Another 6% comes from Gavi Alliance, which is also Bill Gates, rounding him out at some 16% of funding to the WHO, at the least, rivaled only by Germany, who overtook the U.S. as the biggest contributor at 17%. The Gates Foundation, much like having an arms dealer at the UN Security Council, has been a key donor to the WHO over the past decade, accounting for as much as 13% of the group's budget for just the 2016 to 2017 period. Only 55% of WHO funding comes from member states. The rest comes from foundations, banks, partnerships, i.e. pharma and big tech, UN organizations and more. For a fun example of the revolving door theater that is our world regulators, the top funders for the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Program was none other than influenza vaccine manufacturer Sanofi at $16 million and GlaxoSmithKline at $10 million. Now Israel, who intends to sign this treaty, published in 2020 that they also signed for the first time ever a country cooperation strategy with the UN for years 2019 to 2025. The purpose is, quote, the development of priorities for public health action to support the adoption of e-health and big data in healthcare systems. The plan elaborates its intention to advance emergency preparedness and response and strengthen the role of Israel in global health by increasing collaboration between the WHO and Israeli scientific institutions across sector, as well as a collaboration on strategies and exchange of ideas and approaches. The agreement goes on to say, digital health is a national priority in Israel as part of the country's research and development strategy. Collated data is broken down across socioeconomic groups to enable policymaking by evidence. Big data analysis, telemedicine tools, genomics and personalized medicine and health service, and health service management, computerized patient records are part of operational testing and implementation and integration. The Ministry of Health coordinates big data projects to streamline the use of tech in population health, with the goal of integrating big data solutions in Israeli health care. The ATON project plans to combine the existing OFIC platform that collects data from HMOs, hospitals, and healthcare organizations already for 20 years and put it all together in one platform and access it to caregivers. And Project Timna will promote data collection, storage, and analysis of it all. 20 of our world leaders, including Boris Johnson, Emmanuel Macron, Joe Biden, and Australian PM Scott Morrison, are rallying hard for this treaty, comparing our post-COVID world to post-World War II. I guess we're allowed to make comparisons after all. They've stated we have need now to, quote, dispel the temptations of isolationism and nationalism and to address the challenges that could be only achieved together in the spirit of solidarity and cooperation, namely peace, prosperity, health and security. The Biden administration thinks this plan is so splendid, it submitted amendments to the treaty to give the director general the right to declare health emergencies in any nation, even when disputed by that country amendments which may be legally binding under international law. This greatest seizing of power in the history of humankind is set to move forward when they convene at the World Health Assembly in just a few days, from May 22nd to the 28th, to vote on Provision 16.2, which involves the member state sharing of information with the WHO at the onset of outbreak in that country, and the WHO's authority to alert other countries if they deem it necessary. Why? Would any nation voluntarily give up its sovereignty? What might possess 194 countries to allow the centralization of power in a single body, perhaps even in a single individual? Tedros, the current director general, neither hallowed doctor nor scientist, has opened ties and accusation of terrorist activity in his homeland, Ethiopia. As Minister of Health there, he was accused of systematic discrimination and human rights abuses by refusing health care to the Amharic ethnic groups for their affiliation with the opposition party. In 2017, he was accused of covering up a cholera epidemic in Ethiopia, though it raged in bordering Somalia. Tedros received the ire of U.S. doctors who wrote, quote, Your silence about what is clearly a massive cholera epidemic in Sudan daily becomes reprehensible. So this is an example of who will rule us? These bodies funded and run by career figureheads who haven't laid a single hand on an actual patient the entire pandemic? 
those who've already declared their mission to see at least 70% of the world injected? Even proponents of COVID narrative injectables have voiced their concern. The IJC, International Commission for Jurists, called for the pandemic treaty to be grounded in human rights and submitted to them 10 principles they asked to be adopted. They also requested the participation of civil society organizations to be involved in the drafting. Lest, without their input, we, quote, lose the lessons of those who fought for human rights and rule of law throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Human Rights Watch, too, was quoted as warning that the proposed treaty not be undermined by the same abuses of power and monopolizations and further marginalization of the already disenfranchised that marked the past two years of pandemic policy. On May 4th in the UK, a petition was launched demanding a national referendum before the UK agrees to the WHO treaty. The petition already has 120,000 signatures and will run on their site until November 3rd, where all UK citizens are invited to sign. 